Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us for this last session uh, on the first day of WordCamp Brighton. I hope you've had a great time. Um, obviously, we are going to be doing this panel on the future of WordPress. Um, what we'd like to do, just so you have an idea, is we'll do a couple of questions uh, that we've prepared, um, and then we'd take it to the audience so that you don't have to save up your questions until the end. Um, and then we'll do another open Q&A at the end of the session. So we're going to jump straight in. Um, the kind of first initial theme that we're going to be talking about is the kind of professional WordPress world. So I'm going to go straight in with my first question uh, to the panel. Um, in a world that is increasingly competitive, what will be the most important differentiation factors in the future? <laughs> passing the buck there. I'm going to go with adaptability. <laughs> Because uh, the things that are changing are changing so quickly and so common that there is no more common thread in what WordPress is. Those companies that are able to adapt to the change and restructure themselves basically every year to where the internet is going, those are the ones that are going to keep up. Yeah, um, yeah I'd, I'd like to add that I think that it is becoming more and more important um, that you put yourself in a position then you, that you can seize opportunities once they present themselves. Uh, that's basically the side effect of having an ever-changing environment. Uh, once um, there is an actual opportunity, you want to be in the best spot to be able to act quickly and be the first to market to whatever that opportunity has presented. Thank you so much. Um, so, the technology industry is changing really fast. Um, we're going to go with this whole constant change. Uh, I'm interested to find out, for the people who do own companies or work for companies, uh, what the future of your company is in WordPress. Thanks, Anna. Um, so it's a good question and something that's on my mind a lot at the moment. Um, and I think it comes to thinking about what what is it that we're trying to achieve with WordPress? What was the sort of human um, need or desire that WordPress obviously fits so well because it's been so popular and so successful, which is, I think, people's desire to communicate and connect. And um, so the future for us is about looking at how we take that, that capability, that understanding out of um, out of WordPress and try and build it into a more tran transcendent kind of value proposition. Um, and that's about understanding how people, organizations, machines all want to communicate and looking at how content management supports that. Thanks, David. Does anybody else want to speak to that question? So I'm not, a, not technically a company owner. Uh, but I'm working a lot with uh, other companies. Um, and I think that uh, we're at a changing point right now where people have to recognize that uh, the one software foundation they used that was always that, that solid rock um, that didn't budge uh, with any current trends, um, that, that, that is slowly shifting. And... Um, it is uh, both uh, a risk and an opportunity uh, for, for company owners. Uh, and I think it will uh, drastically reshape uh, the way companies generally see WordPress as, as part of their, of their stack, of their product offerings, as being uh, more of a, a generalist building block rather than uh, the core foundation that they use to sell something. So um, in the future, I think that you will not sell WordPress so-and-so. Um, you will sell a solution, and you will find the best way to use WordPress and other components to, to build that solution. Thanks, Elaine. Um, so we're going to be looking now kind of outside of the WordPress world. Um, we're going to, the first question is, uh, what do you think needs to happen for WordPress to become a kind of a truly global project? 
Um, I think the biggest thing is listening. So uh, listening and uh, finding out what that means. So learning about different cultures, um, both from uh, people to contribute food to how the product itself behaves. It's kind of a short answer, but really just um, listening and through listening you have understanding, and then that's that's like the baseline for it. It needs to involve just just observing, really. I. S I think that in one of the ways that WordPress is lacking is internationally. If you're not a native English speaker, it's very hard to contribute to WordPress mm -hmm. even today. And s reaching out to more people and listening means that we're going to have to start listening to people, not just from different cultures, but in different languages and bring more of that into WordPress. If you want to be global, you have to act global. And we're getting there, but not very fast. <laughs> I um, I often find that uh, WordPress is uh, working a lot on improving uh, the language support of uh, internationalization. Uh, there's a lot of work being done, uh, and there's lots and lots of volunteer hours that go into translating the project and making it available in all languages. Um, but the more that this happens, the more it becomes obvious that um, the the structure at the core of the project and the decision making needs to all also take the cultural diverse, uh, diverseness into account. And you see more and more that, um, that some directions of the project and some de decisions uh, are taken in one context and not directly applicable in a different cultural context. So just making it accessible to more cultures is, is not enough. You all will also have to take their context into account when you decide on the next steps of the project. Thank you so much. Um, cool, so we're gonna be now kind of looking at how WordPress exists, um, even kind of outside of the community. So we know that we've got this kind of huge user base, hundreds of millions of people, um, and we've got you know hundreds of thousands of people within this community. But what do you think that we can learn from how people are using WordPress? that exist outside of the kind of standard contribution groups? Please come yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think just the stories and, um, is, ah, I'm gonna say listening again, but it is that, right? It's, um, we can learn how people use WordPress in small and big ways. And by understanding all those stories, that's how we can, decide the direction um, and surfacing and telling those stories is, is also really, really important. So listening isn't just like, oh, I heard you and then walking off. That's mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but listening is an, is an active state, right? You listen and then you process and then you, you relay what you listen. That, that's the whole way we should be doing it. So really surfacing the stories, surfacing the ways and when decisions are made, taking those into account that way. Yeah, I, th I think it's looking at what's going on outside of even people that are using WordPress. It's it's looking at the web, right? You know, social. It's looking at what what's happening with uh, software development in other spaces. So um, I've found the kind of whole blockchain and cryptocurrency space really interesting to look at what happens when you change some parameters with open source software developer development. Like what happens when you put a, you know. You can do a pull request that's worth tens of millions of pounds. Like, how do you manage the governance around something like that? Um, but just looking at the trends that are kind of here and now, so uh, social, messenger, chat, all that kind of stuff, but also the stuff that's coming down the road, chatbots, mixed reality, AI, um, sort of data, data visualizations and enrichment of content that go beyond what, you know, anything that we get out of WordPress. Um, with the five minute install, but there's still a, a really important role for WordPress to play in supporting all those kind of technologies. So there's, as much as anything, I think it's about understanding what the vision for WordPress is in five years time and what the strategy is about how we're gonna get it there and then evaluating all of the, all of the noise and all of the signals and being able to process those into, yes, this is in line or no, it's not and 
we're, we're okay with that or we're not okay with that, so we need to course correct. And um, like calling back to Elaine's uh, point about governance, decision making, how, how that works, I think is something that, um, y you know, it's, it's a really interesting sort of um, challenge. For, mm -hmm. for us as a community. I think for software development, generally like open source software development, I mean, there are some great examples of long-term successful open source projects. Is that, you know, what, what's the magic source behind that? And uh, how, do we, how do we look at it on every level? Not only what the users want, but what the developers want, what the businesses that are using it want, what the ecosystem wants. And all of that is a, it's a leaning tower to try and keep mm -hmm. upright. That's a really good point, actually, because you lead me on to my next question, uh, which is it's kind of the same question, but just takes into consideration uh, what processes we can actually learn. So as opposed to learning from people, what processes can we learn um, from outside of the community? Uh, before I started working in WordPress, I worked for a bank for almost 15 years. And one of the things that I noticed in software was how slow the development process was, but also how rarely things actually changed when they changed. They'd either be very incremental and a massive update that did nothing, or it would be what they would call a small update and everything changed. And I think that by looking at how traditional business used to run software before we finally all accepted that open source was actually working a bit better than they thought it was, we can see the missteps that were made. We can see that holding onto things too closely and not letting change from outside come into us will prevent us from growing. We can look at things like Squarespace and we can look at Wix and we can see where are they excelling and where didn't they excel. We can look at Medium and say, okay, they did a very good job with an editor, but they did a bad job the way that they handled ads and that didn't work out as all, at all well when they started trying to make a gated community. So if that doesn't work, what can we learn from them and carry into us? And it's, it's being aware of what all those things out there are doing and how it comes back into us. I think on a process level, we also need to look at just systems. So uh, design systems, ways of generating and sticking things together and processes and structure so that we're not dependent on um, reinventing all the time so that we maximize and we really refine what we have and we take audit and that kind of structure is something that sometimes feels like, ah, oh, too much structure. We can't do that and we won't be able to be creative in that. Actually, when you add that kind of structure, you can be more creative. And part of the success of the future is gonna be having that process that then we can shoot for the moon. We can go and do all those crazy, amazing things because we have that base and, and that solidity and that consistent product and I use the word product because that is what WordPress is and it has to be, um, both from a contribution and from a actual, the product itself that is used. And contribution is also a product. But having that basis that then we can experiment, iterate and refine, rather than every time we do something, having to guess what shade gray we have or have to guess this blue or guess this button or, uh, it's, it's kind of that doesn't move us forward, that, that kind of stalls that creativity. I think there's also a lot of value to be found in uh, academia um, because computer science is a, a much older and mature, a much more mature discipline than most people assume because everything seems to be moving so fast, uh, but things were pretty much all uh, every time the same for the last few decades. So people have figured a lot of stuff out already and have solved a lot of problems. And academia does not always have the answer of what is the right way to do something. But oftentimes, they've built theoretical models that can tell you the things that will certainly not work out. And um, instead of treading down that path, and uh, adapting processes that are already theoretically flawed only to find, find out six months later or six years later that, uh, oops, that did not really help us uh, move forward. Um, oftentimes, academia can help avoid these pitfalls because they've already solved these problems th theoretically to at least exclude the stuff that cannot work. 
I think I'd like to dream a little bit bigger and look at um, the economy and politics as processes and um, I'll say this as quickly as I can. I went to a really great talk that I'd recommend you try and watch. It was at, uh, South by Southwest by a guy called Tim O'Reilly, and he's been in tech for f far longer than I have. He uh, started O'Reilly Publishing, and he made some really good points about how basically tech's coming, it's going to disrupt a whole bunch of stuff, and the time where technology companies could kind of play this neutral, academic, ascetic kind of role in society is long gone and that actually it's a kind of the, our generation now kind of the, it's up to technologists to help drive that change because we're doing it like even by choosing not to get actively involved with stuff we are shaping the future and so I'd like to look at um, processes around governance and um, what that how that works in open source how that might work in other kind of human processes, what doesn't work in other human processes, how do we learn from that in um, software development, but also increasingly economics, economic processes. I think wherever you, whatever, whatever people do often comes down to watching the, watching the money, you know, that's motivation and it's constraint and it's just one of those kind of fundamental forces that seems to transcend pretty much anything else. And so I definitely see a time where pragmatic employees, behavioral ec economists, um, to understand what the economic value of content transactions, behaviors are, how those interactions play out between people, uh, third parties, um, customers, suppliers, all this stuff, and just think about software and the internet for what it really is, which is, you know, a vast economy which until now is really just underpinned by advertising money and e-commerce, whereas actually there's a, a whole kind of iceberg of value of kind of content and information and relationships underneath that, which is, is kind of masked by, you know, those kind of two, two economic underpinnings. Long answer, but like, let, <laughs> let's look everywhere and see what we can learn and fix. Cool, thank you so much, everyone, for answering those questions. Um, so I think I would like to open the questions to the floor, um, just to give you some idea of other things that we're gonna be dealing with. We're gonna be talking about the REST API in Gutenberg, uh, so if you do have any questions specific to that, then just wait a little while, and we'll deal with them in a sec. Um, <laughs> but does anybody have any questions about what we just talked about, um, or something else which I haven't mentioned? It's only time for a few questions, so I will quickly move on. If uh, nobody has a question, let's have a look. No, obviously we prepared all the questions that you had anyway, so that was good. <laughs> okay, cool, I'll take that back. Oh, Thanks. Oh, we've got one. <laughs> you don't need that, you can shout. Let's do that. Thanks, Laura. <laughs> um, I don't know if I'm gonna say this, but see if I can. Um, how do you see the internet with all these small companies doing different things and helping each other being dominated by monopolies? Big, big corporations, big investment, and then everything is churned out as, um, you know, as, uh, you know, like a lot of the companies have just dominate in that area. I mean, the thing is, certainly my generation have seen internet as a freedom and lots of new things happening. But what about the future where, it, you know, some of the change, there isn't so much change and that everyone is doing the same thing. Is that enough? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I think, I think Tammy and I work for the largest companies on the line. Um, I don't think that it's going to become that homogenous. I don't think that there will be one company, not even one CMS. I don't even think that WordPress would ever have 100% uh, usage because people like to express themselves in different ways. L just like we've got family members who love Twitter versus Facebook versus Tumblr, we're always going to have different ways that we want to be and that we want to communicate and that we want to talk. Uh, I can't make a podcast to save my life. I tried it twice, I'm terrible at it, but I love listening to them and I have 
some, two of my best friends have a podcast now, and I love listening to it every week. And I think it's great that we've got these different ways to do those things. And I speak as a, DreamHost is relatively small when it comes to the web, uh, web host world. We're around 200 people. And when you compare us to GoDaddy and to Bluehost and all those other very large companies in the United States, we're tiny. And we get a lot done. And people stay with different companies because of the people and that they share the same ethos and the same ideals. And if you just want one thing, one specific need from a host, it almost doesn't matter where you go. But once you start wanting to express yourself in those different ways and wanting to do things in a way that suits your needs and your desires, you start to find that different companies offer things in different ways. Uh, just like I don't think we'll ever have Facebook will be the use, use for everyone or Twitter, I think that we will continue to have multiple different companies offering us up different ways to do those things. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Glenn? Uh, there's also a sort of inverse dynamic uh, that happens in, in, in the economics of uh, not only the internet, uh, just generally. If you have a, a company that really has a monopolistic uh, role, the more it becomes this monopolistic entity, the more it opens itself up to, be, to become vulnerable to uh, a new disruptive uh, entry into the market because the simple fact of having a, a, a monopoly creates opportunity. And um, so this basically means that uh, the closer you get to your worst case that you portray in your, in your uh, possible future, the more probable it becomes that there will just be a new actor that enters and completely disrupts the status quo and creates something new that is just a direct result of the opportunity that that monopoly has created. Yeah, thank you so much. We've got time for one more question for now and then I'll move on. Great, thanks. Thank you. Hi, um, speaking of economics and the currently most of the internet is based on advertising money and e-commerce. And also the fact that GDPR has been with us for a year now. Uh, where do you see WordPress and privacy sort of taking that while also taking into account economics, but also keeping users' data close to it? Uh, great question, Gabor. Thank you. Um, I think there's a couple of key trends. So one is that something needs to change about WordPress and data um, in terms of sort of self-hosted WordPress. I think there's a real opportunity there for kind of, you know, like doing staging site, local site, live site, that whole workflow of kind of configuration, settings, content between different environments and version control, but it's in the database, but it should it be, et cetera. I think that's like one of the key challenges that we have to try and solve for. And I think they'll we'll see services that are abstracting content, maybe even content storage, not content management, content storage out of WordPress. Definitely identity management, I think is, you know, there are lots of platforms that are doing that. I mean, a lot of people say it's kind of the end of the in anonymous internet now and that um, actually there's so much tracking that people are kind of now aware of that that does go on that people are going to be more accepting that you know I'm going to have a persona it's going to save me f filling it in a bunch of forms and I think we're going to see that so for me WordPress's role is actually about going back to that kind of vision and strategy of exactly what WordPress is going to be doing in five or ten years time I think it's going to become more specialized as a kind of um, it will still have that kind of bundle of APIs, you know, the user API, blah, 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 to build a cohesive system, but more, um, more and more, I think we're just going to see kind of services knocking bits of that out. And so WordPress is going to find, I think, like a really sweet spot as um, a world-class content editing platform. 
and actually a lot of the other stuff, particularly for kind of corporate use, is going to become uh, SaaS and platform based. So that's one trend. Um, the other one is my pet topic at the moment, which is the blockchain and cryptocurrency stuff, which is um, there are a number of projects out there that are already doing this sort of stuff. So um, basic attention token is one, and that kind of redefines the value proposition between advertisers, um, publishers, and website visitors. There are others like the Truth Data Cloud, which basically says, you know, create your data profile and earn money through letting advertisers kind of access this. And I think, again, it feels like callback central, but calling back to the, the question you had about monopolies and Alan's like excellent point about like yin and yang and within every kind of monolith there's the birth of a radical you know that's essentially what we're seeing now I think in terms of technology both in terms of the well I think with specifically with technology it's like a, a push back against that kind of advertising power um, there's a project called civil which is one of my favorites which is actually a wordpress.com VIP um, client Super interesting, looking at basically fixing journalism and uh, how you can run a newsroom without having to be beholden to advertising or affiliate revenue or e-commerce or kind of uh, even subscriptions, which for consumers can be pretty clunky. You know, you go away on holiday, you don't want to pay your three pounds for your subscription that you don't use for that month. So I think those are two trends that I come, I see coming along and. Uh, radically changing what we think about WordPress is, is doing. Cool. I think I just took all the time for answering. No, Sorry. no, you didn't. <laughs> I have loads of time. Thank you so much. Um, we'll just move back into the uh, panel questions, and then we'll take another Q&A break at the end. I'll give that to you, Dave. Thanks. Um, OK, cool. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the West API and Gutenberg, some exciting projects over the last couple of years that we've had. Um, so looking back to 2015, 16, when Gutenberg, uh, when, sorry, the REST API was merged into Core, um, obviously we're seeing a lot of projects using the REST API, um, and I'm sure through all the work that you've done, you've, you've kind of come into contact with it. Um, so how much usage are you actually seeing kind of day to day? Uh, one of the things I, I do for WordPress is I review plugins for the plugin directory. So in the last 18 months, there's been a, a drastic uptick, actually, of use of the REST API, where people are finding out new ways to call back to other sites to extract data without having to reinvent the wheel, without having to make their own builds of APIs. They're able to just call WordPress and say, oh, I've got data that I store in my site that I publish from. It's already in a REST API. I can use another plugin and grab it and post it on other sites. So where we were once using RSS feeds and email, we can now switch to using the REST API. And that starts as the very basic conversation because once you've done that, you can think, well, if I can do an API to pull the data, then I can use the API to send the data. And suddenly I've got a system that's talking back and forth to itself. I can just do it in WordPress. and I don't have to build all of these things. All the tools are there. I just have to activate them. And it started to open up a new generation of builds, which I find absolutely fascinating. Does anybody else care to uh, speak to that? Thanks. Um, I, I've seen less uh, direct use of the REST API in, uh, in most of my daily work. Uh, but I noticed that um, as soon as it got more real with uh, the Gutenberg development, um, that really pushed a lot of uh, the REST API um, development work. It also created a lot of new questions. Um, and it made it obvious that, um, that there's still, uh, that the foundation, the data model foundation that the REST API is built on uh, is not fully complete. Um, uh, so I think that um, probably without such a big project like Gutenberg pushing the envelope and moving everything forward, uh, a lot of potential plugins were still being uh, blocked by missing pieces of the REST API. And we will never hear about many of these because they just 
never were able to, to get into a fully working state. And an, uh, an individual plugin certainly didn't have the resources uh, to, to rethink the, the REST API uh, implementation was once it was merged into core. So I think with Gutenberg, now the, the, the actual abstraction that the REST API presents becomes more and more complete. And we will only now be able to, to fully see what people are capable of doing with plugins. So it's very uh, great to hear that a lot of plugins are already making use of this, but I think the real opportunities were still partially blocked until we now came to fully realize this REST API through Gutenberg. A quick plug for Alan, who's too modest, and um, my good colleague, Sean, who are doing a workshop tomorrow morning, looking at using the WordPress uh, REST API and uh, Ionic, so that's definitely worth checking out. And my quick two cents, just because I got the mic, is that <laughs> I've long seen WordPress as like, I've described it as digital glue. You know, there's an integration with everything. There's a plugin for anything. And it's sort of, if you want to build something quickly out of blocks, like putting WordPress in the middle is a pretty good start. And for me, the REST API basically supercharges that trend and means that actually you can drop it all into almost any kind of architecture. And it's got a role to play. So it, it's sort of, it's a very enabling technology. You know, Gutenberg. Um, the REST API, uh, the Google AMP stuff. Um, there's a P1 as well. Progressive web apps, headless CMS, all this stuff. You know, those kind of uh, those trends together, I think, point to the future of, of WordPress. Hmm. Um, cool. Uh, you've all answered my next question, which was about <laughs> adoption of, but of the REST API by the WordPress community, which is great. Um, so, You're welcome. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, so, if we Actually, you were, we were talking a little bit about uh, kind of AI and machine learning, maybe a little bit. So I'll move to that question. Um, what impact do you think technologies like um, AI and machine learning will have on WordPress? When I was six or seven, I used to travel with my father. Uh, he used to talk about artificial intelligence, and he worked for NASA. Uh, Post the Challenger disaster, my father was on the uh, the team that helped figure out what actually happened. And because of that, he got roped into talking about artificial intelligences and how can we predict uh, change. And what he is now is he's a risk analyst. And by that, I mean like actually figuring out things like why did the uh, the power plants in Japan uh, have a critical failure, not like risk management like software, like just you know, oh, your company's going to fail, but like actual risk management. And from him, I learned at a very early age that there's actually nothing, AI isn't anything more than a bunch of nested if statements that are enacting decisions that are made by experts. So whenever I go into, well, how will AI change computing? All it's really doing is helping us narrow down what the actual answers are because you know, we see Star Trek and we see you know, Captain Picard say that he wants his tea Earl Grey hot, but who taught the computer what hot meant? How, does, how do those things get known? And it's because an expert had to go in and teach the computer that when Picard says hot, this is what his temperature is. And we like to say that, oh, it's an artificial intelligence that, that knows these things, but no, it's really us teaching it these things. So the secret and the magic of artificial intelligence becomes us understanding ourselves a lot better and being able to record history in a way that the computer can extrapolate from, but it'll still only ever know what we've told it. Oh. Oh, hang on a second. Sorry, we'll take. Oh, sorry, we'll take questions. Sorry, uh, we'll take questions in a second. Thanks. Sorry, just a sec. We'll take questions in a second. Thank you so much for your input. I think I might probably answer your thing anyway. Um, so I'm going to be contrary here, actually, and like I'm going to agree with Mika. Like AI is actually um, like a, a big batch of technologies. There's a great report there, F FTI. Um, it's like a tech trends report, and the first 28 technologies in that, I think there's 150, the first 28 are all grouped under AI, so it's really kind of a, a family of technologies rather than one thing. There are examples of AIs doing some pretty crazy stuff that we don't understand. You know, there was the Google AI that started creating its own language that nobody else could understand. There are examples of AIs creating other AIs, and so I think there's, there becomes like this complexity theory uh, limit to 
to how, how much we're ever going to understand about what advanced AIs are going to do. Like, we can't understand our own brain. You know, it's just too intense. And I think it is definitely possible to create systems that produce results that we can't possibly comprehend. So I'm going to go, like, drag it from the kind of ethereal and uh, uh, philosophical down to some more practical things quickly. So uh, one thing that I think is a really easy thing to imagine, you upload your image to the Google uh, Media Library. It pings an API. It sends back uh, suggested alt text, title tag, title text, um, meta tags, meta description, checks for licensing, and that you know that's one of the suites of AI technologies that's going to do that. So it's going to help us understand our content and be able to communicate that better. You then publish the story, and AI semantically tags that, suggests the most related stories, and a third party. Identif identity management system is going to come and personalize those results on the fly for, for people. So AI is basically, to agree with Mika so that she doesn't uh, hit me after this panel, <laughs> you know, I, I agree that AI is going to help us understand ourselves better and that essentially it's going to be a tool in our kit to make sure that our communications are more and more effective. Um, but I do think that there's a note of caution that it's entirely possible for us to create something that we could never understand. You go first, go ahead. Um, yeah, I've read a lot about um, uh, AI a few months uh, back, and there's a lot of controversial discussions happening about what the future holds and whether we would even be able to control it once that really happens, uh, because we would basically create something that overtakes us in the food chain of thinking. Um, um, so we, as, um, as David said, we would not be able to comprehend it, because at a certain complexity level, our brains would be at the technical limits, because it's also just uh, processing ifs. Uh, and at one point, we just build something that goes beyond what our technical implementation can handle. Um, so there's, um, I agree that there's caution to, to be had there, and it might be sooner rather than later that uh, that some form of government uh, governance and regulation will need to take place. But in the meantime, uh, it's um, it's quite fascinating if you use the, the regular uh, technologies that are already produced as reusable libraries or as software as a service, tag them into the admin backend uh, of your WordPress site and let them just take over some menial decisions that, that save you time, like the automatic tagging is an obvious example. Um, that could also include things like going through the access logs and detecting problems and being smart about dealing with the security actively. That might include um, adapting the design of the site within uh, constraints so that it can magically adapt to new device factors that were never actually programmed against and so forth. It's basically... Um, Right now, you can use it as domain-specific expert systems that take over the decision-making. And if you teach them, if you learn them the right way, they will also produce reliable results. But the entire combination of these expert systems, again, creates another level of, uh, of complexity. And at one point, uh, it, it's... Uh, it goes way beyond just automating your WordPress site and might replace you as the one actually in charge. I think it's worth adding a little note. Um, kind of, we've gone into sci-fi and and kind of big, which is <laughs> no, it's it's also awesome. But I think we have to also think about um, the smaller scale and the fact that a lot of these technologies and predictive or just make things more accessible for people. They make things do what they expected them to do anyway. 
in a non-creepy, stalky way, because then that's just <laughs> weird if something predicts something. Um, and that's like the balance, right? And that's where we, um, one of the, the, we were talking earlier about roles um, in economics and that, but kind of being, I think one of the roles is psychology. And we have to be understanding the brains that we're creating things for. And we have to, so, so from neuroscience to psychology, all of those things need to be part of what we're doing. And we have to understand more. We, ha we have to have that to create something that, that does that correctly. But I just think there's so much on the lower end, the, the less kind of spaceship end, that just is practical things that make things easier for people, that make technology work for them, that maybe was um, a high learning curve for them, now isn't, is something that just, yeah, is more friendly, is more human, which is interesting that we're kind of doing it that way, but just that, that just makes something better for them. And I think we really have to explore that. We can have these wild dreams and all of that kind of stuff, but we can also just see it as something on that smaller scale can just make things work better. One last thing. <laughs> James, so one last thing. <laughs> always, always one last thing. Um, I was at an event yesterday and somebody from Shell, who's a digital transformation lead at Shell, said something really interesting about, um, about software and how people shouldn't need to learn software anymore. And I think whilst we as a kind of WordPress community think, think of ourselves as the puppet masters, actually the future is probably that that's, that's not true. You know, it's gonna become, I mean, it's already within the grasp of um, machine learning or what, you know, whatever it is, an expert machine to produce a website, you know, like the, the grid, that startup, you know, you throw some content at it and it decides what to do with it. And uh, I think as we, as people start to understand content management as a practice better, you know, there's only so many variations on a Gutenberg blog that are actually going to be helpful to anyone ever. And so as that kind of simplifies down, which I think is sort of true with all the technology, actually, you know, it used to be, oh, wow, you can do anything with WordPress, so isn't that really cool? And now people are like, no, I've got these requirements, I want it to do this, can it do it or not? And I think we're going to see the same sort of thing. So actually, the need to code HTML and CSS, you know, front-end JavaScript stuff could well drop out. Um, not tomorrow, don't worry, but I think it's worth thinking about what is, you know, what does a five-year future look like when people can drag and drop all this stuff and, you know, point... I mean, I, I have a... This is my dream product, right? It's like a pre-configured WordPress thing and it's got, like, an expert system, and you put the URL in of the website that you want to migrate over. It's got your brand, blah blah blah, and it just does it all. Because how difficult is it to like assess the amount of color and the images and source the content and whack it all over? And like, how much, how much of a percent of the current like WordPress freelancer and agency economy runs on like migrating content and theming? An awful lot. And um, I just think we have to be realistic and mindful about that. Thank you so much. Um, Sorry to be the harbinger <laughs> of doom. Uh, we've got time for one question. It, did you, was there a question that you needed to ask? No, 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 no. Oh, so just give us a sec for the mic so that the transcribers could. Thank you. Um, no, I, I, I'm sure I could think of loads of questions, but that particular one, that point where I interrupted, was that, that, that years ago, I'm a programmer, I, I used to, um, I've done a lot of programming in the past, and I, um, AI was very much that sort of thing that I mean, Mitchie from um, from um, Edinburgh. You you can make a program and uh, you know it take you a long time to test it, but we still thought that it was the programmer or the compiler writers or the were de determinant. But Google, um, am I right? It's Google DeepMind, is it? Let me say one thing that it's done recently is they learned to play chess. They did, they, they did, it's Alpha Zero was one. They did go, they did, that was a very complicated way. I'm not going to go through all the games and uh, chess and things. Sorry, I'm going to but, have but, to but get quickly, to the question. But quickly, they, they <laughs> taught you. this machine in four hours mm -hmm. to play chess. Oh, well, no, it didn't. It, it, it gave it some parameters and it learned itself. 
playing itself in four hours. There were ex their masters that said, hey, I've never thought of doing that. This is amazing. We've got some expert people on the panel. Um, Do you have a specific question for yeah, them? No, no, I didn't. <laughs> Thank you. No, I was just okay, comment, I was just so I'm going to have to wrap it up because I've got about 10 minutes. Thank you so much. No, no, it's, it's just that, that this AI, I don't know if I, 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 I it's changed. It, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. so sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. You've got all the time in the world. They're going to be at the after party and you can chat to them for hours. It's going to be great. Okay. <laughs> That's a beer conversation, exactly. Okay, we'll give that back. Um, and we will launch straight into kind of where you picked up and, and left off uh, with Gutenberg, which is obviously a hugely hot topic at the moment. Um, so, <laughs> and these questions won't all be for Tammy, I have to <laughs> specify. Please, I will stop that if that happens, as you can tell. I that's what I do. <laughs> Good, thanks, Tammy. Um, okay, cool. So, we'll kind of ease our way in. Um, what problem does Gutenberg, Gutenberg solve? Why do we need it? Why is it being built? Ooh, that's a big few questions. Mm -hmm. um, <sighs> <laughs> Uh, so there's, there's kind of, um, at the moment we talk about the term WordPress way, and this is kind of how, and we accept that everything works in the WordPress way, which is adorable, because it's then a huge learning curve, and then we work around the WordPress way, because that's the way WordPress works. And we also assume, um, and I'm using the collective word we, um, and the learning you know, everybody has to go through that. It's, it's that process. And, and the fact is, it shouldn't be that way. There shouldn't be a WordPress way. There should just be the best way that everyone does everything. And WordPress shouldn't, you shouldn't have to work around WordPress to do a plugin or a builder or anything. You should just be able to create what is the right thing for the right instance. And that's kind of one side. And the other side is just making something that you want that has rich content is so difficult in WordPress, vanilla WordPress. Um, and then, okay, the answer will be, you could use a plugin, or you could use this theme, or you could use this combination. And then people have like this Jenga combination of things because of the WordPress way to get around. They have this interesting mix of things, and they kind of get that, but then they have to learn the WordPress way, and then Bob's plugin way, and then Mary's theme way, and all these kind of combination ways of doing things to get what just should be able to do simply and what people need. They want to write rich content and they want to do that anywhere. They want to be able to uh, express themselves and, and that we can't really do now. So I'm going to ask other people as well, but that's kind of what I feel that it solves. Sure, thank you. I spend a lot of time with companies who use our hosting and then have clients who are actually doing the, the writing. And some of them have come to us and said, you know, we're a little bit afraid of Gutenberg because we're going to have to teach our clients how to do things. And we say, well, how are you teaching your clients how to use WordPress today? And the majority have told me that they're not, that they're working very hard to take people out of WordPress because they find WordPress difficult. And at that point, I say, well, perhaps this is the problem we're attempting to solve with Gutenberg. My father still can't figure out how to write a post in WordPress, and he still emails me. I finally talked him out of emailing me PDFs. Now he emails me a Word document <laughs> and says, can you post this on this date? And I have to explain, yes, Dad, it's schedules. He still doesn't get it because his idea of how you interact with a computer and a website remain different from the way that I do. And when I started showing him Gutenberg and saying, this is how it builds, he said, oh, blocks, that makes sense. Because it was a concept he could understand because he knew printing. And so I found that, that the more we, we act scared of this thing that is changing, the more we restrict ourselves from accepting the fact that what we've got now kind of sucks. <laughs> and, and perhaps, maybe Gutenberg isn't going to be the one fix, but it might get us started, and I, I believe this, that it's going to get us started on making WordPress the thing that we wanted. Because when we talked about artificial intelligences, what I think of as that is I really think of creating a better user experience not necessarily making the computer smarter, but making the computer more interactable. Because it took us a while to get from the phones where we had to press M four times, you know, one letter four times to get, a, to get the right letter. And now we've got our smartphones where we can just type all we want and we can use emoji. It's a progress, it's a process to get there. And for Gutenberg, it's getting us that step of the way where people can write what they see in their mind 
without having to install six plugins and hope that all the plugins are going to work together, because good luck with that, everybody's going to want to write something their own way. And this, maybe now we're giving them the building block to start from. Can I underline that? It's the catalyst that gets us started. Um, so saying it's the solution, it's the start, is kind of the important framing, I think. Helen, did you or Dave? One last thing from Dave. <laughs> well, it's not just about, you know, it's this whole thing where you don't want to have to train people. And it is super complicated. Like, you know, here's a short code. If you want four things and change that number, et cetera. And that it just is rubbish. But it's also about portability of content between systems. So, you know, old editor does some weird WordPressy stuff. New Gutenberg does, you know, semantic mark up in the right way, so content migration should be much less of a uh, pain, even between themes. But for me, even more interestingly, is what that lets you do with the content on the other side of it. So getting the content on the web is part of the problem. What to do with it is the next part. And the idea that actually even a long form piece consists of lots of different things and even different kind of paragraphs can have different purposes. So this might be like an introduction, that might be a conclusion, this might be a quote, that might be a kind of uh, particular type as well as format of information will let us do much more rich things with that content that's stored there. So in terms of theme construction, in terms of distributing that content out across all the different media frankly, in terms of allowing the AI to do more with that content as well. Um, so yeah, it's about ease of getting it in, but also ease of getting it out. Thank you. Um, so we're quickly running out of time. Uh, I'm going to do one more question, and then we're going to open it up to the floor. Um, I'll just do one more question from the panel. Uh, so what are the risks and challenges your company, or you as an individual, uh, sees with Gutenberg? Sorry, Danny. <laughs> Um, I think um, Gutenberg itself is a huge risk that is being taken. Um, the obvious benefit is a disruptive change that propels WordPress forward. Um, the risk is though that, um, so basically w WordPress might be in a spot where Microsoft was at, uh, a few years ago, where basically the entire value proposition they had was to being compatible to themselves. And as long as they kept that, everyone was happy because they didn't need to change anything. They just updated their licensing and all was good. Um, when Microsoft introduced um, a major breaking change that made this updating of license uh, not work anymore, which basically forced everyone uh, to eat migration costs to the next version of, uh, of their Windows operating system. It made a lot of people rethink, well, if I do need to pay for migration, my option goes beyond just the next version of Windows. My option is any other system, and now I can rethink the choices I made uh, before. Um, so. For WordPress, there is a real risk that the platform is uh, putting itself into a position where um, people need to strongly rethink whether WordPress is the right choice for their current needs. And that might lead them to conclusions that, that brings them off of the WordPress platform. Hmm. But is that necessarily a bad thing? Because, yes, we would lose people who use WordPress, but at the same time, Drupal has already picked up and said they like the idea of Gutenberg. They want to use Gutenberg. And so we already have some proof that outside of WordPress, this may be the right path to be walking down. And if we do lose people, we can learn something from the loss. We shouldn't be afraid of loss and make that stop us from trying to progress. If, if we get chained by fear, we'll never get anywhere. I would underline that. I think the risk is that we have paralysis by fear and that we don't... It sounds dramatic, but... <laughs> uh, that we don't listen. Everybody, anybody. We don't 
hear each other. We don't uh, remember we're all human and we are all doing WordPress and we all want the best future for WordPress. And that might be different things that different people want, but just responding to that and processing together. Um, and, and we have to make change. If you don't make change as a project or as a product, it's not around very much longer. <laughs> and I think everybody probably wants WordPress to be around for a little bit longer <laughs> without a WordCamp, right? Um, so that, that's kind of the big risk. The challenge is equally that, is just taking some time to let every voice be heard, just taking some time to process that and finding ways through. Inside, those, those of us who are making Gutenberg, who are part, there's lots in this room who are part of um, that project. And... And that's everybody from the person that um, does some testing through to the person that comments through to the person that does actually the code work or design work. Everybody is contributing to this project. And, th and the challenge is really to get education and really kind of help each other find the way and find what Gutenberg works for them. Um, Gutenberg is a big word for a lot of things it's becoming. It, it's the editor, but it's more than that. It's, it's that kind of encompassing. Thank you so much. Was that a final word? Just a very final word, please, Dave. A few seconds. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sorry. And now for a final word from Dave. <laughs> yeah, I mean, all, all that stuff, totally, but I think the biggest risk is not doing this. Um, like, it, if anyone that's sane has used Tiny MCE and they've used Gutenberg, you know, I not, I, maybe not on like a super slow uh, connection or like, etc. But like in kind of reasonable use, if you use Tiny MCE and you've used Gutenberg and you don't think that Gutenberg is better, then like I, I can't relate to that. And I think one thing that we have to get our heads around as a community is that market share of CMS doesn't necessarily equate to value created or importance or significance. It's a little bit like running a business so you can say, oh, we do 10 million revenue a year. Uh, you ask what the profit is, like 1,000 pounds. <laughs> you know, like we should be focused on building the very best product that delivers the most value where it can. And if we, if we get stuck in this paradigm of don't do anything, we might drop a percentage point, then we're gonna end up with a totally rubbish product and We'll lose, we'll lose everything over time. Thank you so much. Um, no, no, I'm going to pass it quickly around the audience. <laughs> I know that there was a girl there with her hand up. Uh, so we've, we've got very few minutes to do an audience Q&A. So I'm only going to be able to take maybe two or three questions. Uh, but all these lovely people are going to be available this evening and tomorrow. Okay, this is super quick. Um, I am a user of WordPress, so it's a bit low level probably for some people, but I just want to know with the Gutenberg, is that being rolled out to everyone? So if you're already doing posts, can't, won't you be able to use that anymore? And is it just, could you briefly just say why it's better to be putting these blocks in rather than writing the whole thing really briefly? And also, will it, com will it work well with SEO? And if it won't have any effect on that, just say it'll be totally fine. I just want to. No, because that I'm, was a yeah. sneaky three Here question. I you may want to know that. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> Your SEO will be fine. Uh, I'm gonna. I'll field it and I can pass it to Tony. I think you've got it. I think <laughs> All right. Um, not everyone has Gutenberg yet. You saw the call out in the last release of WordPress asking you to install it. When WordPress 5.0 comes out, everyone will have it, and it will be currently. I believe it's going to be the, the default editor for everyone. Um, why are blocks better? They're not better or worse. They're just a different way to conceptualize your concept, your content. We've all been thinking of, I just want to write. You can still do that. And in fact, I do. I go through and I just write my content out. And then I go back and say, OK, here I want a header. So let me insert a header. Here I want an image. And it, it, it's the same. It's just thinking of them as my Lego blocks. And I can move them around instead of saying, this is my content and it has to match a page. Thank you so much to our mic runners. Hey. I suppose in the briefest way possible, uh, I'll ask this question, which is that we've had the customizer, uh, the REST API. We've now got Gutenberg. Already bored with all of them. 
each individual person on the panel. Tell us how you feel, Kim. <laughs> each, in, each individual person on the panel, if you could say what excites you next, what's the next thing you'd like to add to WordPress or change about WordPress? Uh, the thing that excites me uh, the most right now and where I expect big things in the future is that um, there's more and more computer science and software engineering entering the WordPress world and we might finally be able to stop reinventing the same wheel all the time and build on work that other people have done and grow from there and build something new. I think the thing that excites me most is because of the REST API and Gutenberg getting finally some of the love that they deserve, it's going to be easier for new people to step in and build plugins because currently I feel that the settings API is a bag of wet hair mm -hmm. and having some step forward where that's going to be easier to use for new people is fantastic. So I think uh, having a design system is something I'm super excited about moving on. Um, really auditing, taking, um, I mentioned it at the beginning, but doing that and then we have a better experience, more cohesive, and then we can, like, it, it's like taking audit, tidying your room, and then deciding what to go. And to make that next move, I think we need to do that as well. I'm not actually sure if we've got time for <laughs> Laura can tell us. <laughs> We're well over. I didn't think that we were going to do this, but thank you so much. A round of applause for our wonderful panel.